Welcome to My on Mondays, an explorative approach to the possessive my through narratives, art, and sound. Each Monday brings a new creation and unique perspective. My on Mondays is brought to you by Ming Studios, a contemporary art space and international artist residency program dedicated to the exhibition, experience, and exploration of arts and culture. Along with exhibiting artists from around the world, Ming also serves the community by hosting innovative programs including performances, workshops, screenings, readings, artist talks, and other cultural activities. For more information or if you'd like to participate in Maya on Mondays, you can visit our website at mingstudios.org. Hello and welcome to the 24th episode of Maya on Mondays. Today we continue with our public archive series. While much of what can be found in this resource may be obscure, today's episode focuses on Lord Byron, one of the most well-known figures of the Romantic era. In 1824, one month after his death, Byron's memoirs, which had been entrusted to his literary executor and were supposed to have been published, were instead deemed too scandalous and burnt by Byron's publisher. In response to what he considered a betrayal of both Byron and the public, Thomas Medwin, writer and cousin to Byron's good friend Percy Bysshe Shelley, published his book, lengthily titled, Journal of the Conversations of Lord Byron Noted During a Residence with His Lordship at Pisa in the years 1821 and 1822. In the preface he wrote, A great poet belongs to no country. His works are public property and his memoirs the inheritance of the public. Such were the sentiments of Lord Byron, and have they been attended to? Has not a manifest injustice been done to the world, and an injury to his memory by the destruction of his memoirs? These are questions which it is now late, perhaps needless, to ask, but I will endeavor to lessen, if not remedy, the evil. Today I'll be reading an excerpt from the beginning of this book, where Medwin describes his introduction and first impressions of Byron, a vivid and delightful window into his personality, a moment of his life, and the era. During the few minutes that Lord Byron was finishing his letter, I took an opportunity of narrowly observing him and drawing his portrait in my mind. Thorwaldson's bust is too thin-necked and young for Lord Byron. None of the engravings gave me the least idea of him. I saw a man of about five feet seven or eight, Apparently forty years of age, as was said of Milton, he barely escaped being short and thick. His face was fine, and the lower part symmetrically molded, for the lips and chin had that curved and definite outline that distinguishes Grecian beauty. His forehead was high and his temples broad, and he had a paleness in his complexion almost to wanness. His hair, thin and fine, had almost become grey and waved in natural and graceful curls over his head that was assimilating itself fast to the bald first Caesars. He allowed it to grow longer behind than it is accustomed to be worn, and at that time had mustachios which were not sufficiently dark to be becoming. In criticizing his features it might perhaps be said that his eyes were placed too near his nose, and that one was rather smaller than the other. They were of a grayish-brown, but of a peculiar clearness— and when animated possessed fire which seemed to look through and penetrate the thoughts of others, while they marked the inspirations of his own. His teeth were small, regular, and white. These, I afterwards found, he took great pains to preserve. I expected to discover that he had a club, perhaps a cloven foot, but it would have been difficult to have distinguished one from the other, either in size or in form. On the whole, his figure was manly, and his countenance handsome and prepossessing and very expressive, and the familiar ease of his conversation soon made me perfectly at home in his society. Our first interview was marked with a cordiality and confidence that flattered while it delighted me, and I felt anxious for the next day in order that I might repeat my visit. When I called on his lordship at two o'clock, he had just left his bedroom and was at breakfast, if it can be called one. It consisted of a cup of strong green tea without milk or sugar and an egg, of which he ate the yolk raw. I observed the abstemiousness of his meal. "'My digestion is weak. I'm too bilious,' said he, to eat more than once a day, and generally live on vegetables. 
To be sure, I drink two bottles of wine at dinner, but they form only a vegetable diet. Just now I live on claret and soda water. You are just come from Geneva, Shelley tells me. I passed the best part of the summer of 1816 at the Campagna Diodati and was very nearly passing this last there. I went so far as to write to Hench, the banker, but Shelley, when he came to visit me at Ravenna, gave me such a flattering account of Pisa that I changed my mind. Then it is troublesome to travel so far with so much live and dead stock as I do, and I don't like to leave behind any of my pets that have been accumulating since I came on the continent. One cannot trust to strangers to take care of them. You will see at the farmers some of my pea-fowls en pension. Flencher tells me that they are almost as bad fellow travellers as the monkey, which I will shew you. Here he led the way to a room, which after playing with and caressing the creature for some time, he proposed a game of billiards. I brought the conversation back on Switzerland and his travels, and asked him if he had been in Germany. No, he said, not even at Trieste. I hate despotism and the Goths too much. I have travelled little on the continent, at least never gone out of my way. This is partly owing to the indolence of my disposition, partly owing to my encumbrances. I had some idea, when at Rome, of visiting Naples, but was at that time anxious to get back to Venice. But Pestum cannot surpass the ruins of Agrigentum, which I saw by moonlight, nor Naples, Constantinople. You have no conception of the beauty of the twelve islands where the Turks have their country houses, or of the blue Symplegades, against which the Bosphorus beats with such resistless violence. Switzerland is a country I have been satisfied with seeing once. Turkey I could live in for ever. I never forget my predilections. I was in a wretched state of health and worse spirits when I was at Geneva. But quiet in the lake, physicians better than Polidori, soon set me up. I never led so moral a life as during my resistance in that country, but I gained no credit by it. Where there is a mortification, there ought to be reward. On the contrary, there is no story so absurd that they did not invent at my cost. I was watched by glasses on the opposite side of the lake, and by glasses, too, that must have had very distorted optics. I was waylaid in my evening drives. I was accused of corrupting all the grisettes in the Rue Basse. I believe that they looked upon me as a man-monster, worse than the piqûre. Somebody possessed Madame de Stal with an opinion of my immorality. I used occasionally to visit her at Coppet, and once she invited me to a family dinner, and I found the room full of strangers, who had come to stare at me as at some outlandish beast in a rare show. One of the ladies fainted, and the rest looked as if his satanic majesty had been among them. Madame de Stal took the liberty to read me a lecture before this crowd, to which I only made her a low bow. We're so glad you joined us today. We look forward to bringing you more episodes in the Mondays to come.